This is Nursing 622, Module 4. We had talked about the male previous week, and now we're going to talk uh, about the urological and gynecological disorders. Completion of the module, urological disorders across the lifespan, treatment, um, understanding the diagnostic modalities, and the difference between the genders and what's more common. Female reproductive system, we understand that changes occur well before older adulthood. There's medication, family history. And these are all things that come into play, period. Uh, breasts, is, there's normal aging changes, abnormal changes. If they've breastfed, you know, that can cause uh, normal, abnormal of the breasts. And then the urogenital system, sexual history is very important. Understanding the normal aging changes, reviewing them, assessing them, the examination process, seeing where the tenderness is, seeing if they have any history of lesions, if there's vaginal atrophy, those are things that are important. Whereas men have the GU um, reproductive system with the prostate, the women have their own as well. Symptoms include, you know, the vaginal dryness, dysuria, vulvar vaginal itching, urinary frequency, vaginal discharge, dyspareunia, which is the painful sex. You know, we look at these with the vaginitis, vaginitis and we understand that female genitals can be very inflamed, very tender. Um, the tissue thins, it becomes fragile as fragile as they get older and this contributes to the atrophic vaginitis we lose that estrogen and a lot of women do not want the risk factors of estrogen replacement with a pill because we know blood clots is a risk factor and there's been cancer concerns so there are other treatment plans out there that are only absorbed into the vaginal wall instead of systemically with like a pill so we look at the etiology estrogen deprivation your menopausal patients it does affect all postmenopausal patients why because we know that the estrogen decreases then it's usually an issue of women who are postmenopausal whether it's from normal aging process unfortunately a hysterectomy they can have early menopause those are all the things that need to come into play and then you also have to look at the social aspect and dynamics of that Contributing factors, we know it's a deficiency of the estrogen. We look at the physical exam findings, do a pelvic exam, check their urine, just to make sure we're not missing anything on the urinalysis. Do they have a urinary tract infection? Is there something more going on? When we look at the differential diagnosis and the treatment plan, again, like I said, the non-hormonal lubricants, moisturizers to help restore that to the vaginal wall. Vaginal dilators, sexual activity, these things come into play. If you're dry down there and it's inflamed, it's going to be a hindering factor for sexual activity. So these are things that you need to have a discussion with your patient about. Low-dose vaginal estrogen, and then there's an endometrial biopsy that also looks at it and to give a definitive diagnosis. Follow-up resolution of symptoms, two to three months. Do a follow-up visit follow-up visit hey how are you doing are you doing well if they are on hormone replacement however you do need to make sure every three months you're doing regular visits you're checking are they having any concerns for dvts blood clots pulmonary embolisms those types of things how are they feeling afterwards and then again you can have an infections because anytime you insert creams or are using lubricants there's always that possibility Prevention and prophylaxis, early signs, intermittent use of the topical vaginal estrogen, the vaginal lubricants and moisturizers. Unfortunately, we cannot stop nature and menopause is going to happen. Referring out to a gynecologist is often very helpful just because, again, they are the specialists. If you have someone that has atrophic vaginitis and they're still having symptoms, you can't get them under control, know what you don't know, refer them out education of the lubricants as well as the benefit of regular sexual activity breast cancer some have no symptoms some have masses lumps it's a malignant neoplastic tumor we know that lobular and ductal carcinoma is the most common invasive versus non-invasive less than one percent is for the men we talked about mastitis and things um, previously it affects one in eight women 
age, gender, ethnicity is a concern. Knowing what your patient's background is important. More prevalent in Caucasians and African Americans. However, there's a higher mortality in African American. And is this due to the health disparities with low income with a higher incidence of African American women? Contributing factors, we look at our genes. Age, gender, dense breast tissue, lack of breastfeeding, have they had any children, other genetic factors, hormones, lifestyles, do we need to do genetic testing to look for that BRAC gene? Signs and symptoms, non-existent to obvious, which is why mammograms are so important as a screening, screening tool. Looking at early versus late symptoms, those diagnostic testing, doing a mammo, then you do an ultrasound. If that comes back abnormal, then a fine needle aspiration or a core biopsy is recommended. But again, you're referring them out to the specialist for this. Treatment for breast cancer, multiple different therapies. Again, this is gonna be hematology, oncology, as well as gyneco uh, the gynecologists. With the treatment plan, there are GYN oncologists that specialize in this and it's very important to make sure that follow-up is individualized as well as the treatment plan. Survival rates, patients are going to ask you, you discuss with them, you know, based on treatment plans and be upfront and honest. However, you can't always be brutal and oftentimes I tell them, I don't know the statistics specifically, this is not my specialty. Speak to the GYN oncologist, speak to HEMOC and get a more definitive answer. Prevention prophylaxis, again, your primary prevention. Mammos, breast exams, once a month. Make sure you're covering all of the breast tissue. Genetic testing, lifestyle modifications, and then again, know what you don't know and refer out. Education is the key here for uh, breast cancer. Cystitis is... Uh, very common, you can have dysuria, UTI symptoms. Um, this is where you get the pathogen that goes into the wall of the bladder. Um, and you can get E. coli from the bowel, from the perineum that goes up in there. Increased incidence with age. It's more prevalent with women, of course, because of our anatomy. Factors that can contribute in men, you have the BPH, in, in men and women, you have incontinence and urinary retention. Institutionalization, of course, because there's always that concern of with hygiene and if there's staff available for them to void when they need to and those different things. Shorter urethra in women and then the predisposing factors as we age. Signs and symptoms, gross hematuria is more common in younger women than older adults. Again, increased vasculature can be irritating. A typical presentation can be in older women. Start with your dipstick. Always send a microscopic urinalysis. Do a urine culture, see if there's an infection, and then the radiographic testing. Treatment. Menopausal versus postmenopausal women and men are different. Urinalysis, urine culture, again, that's going to help uh, guide your treatment plan with your sensitivity. If untreated, you can have pyelonephritis, which it travels up into the kidneys, sepsis, urosepsis, shock, death. Prevention, prophylaxis, use of antibiotics with suppressive antimicrobial therapy. If they have a history of it, your urine dipstick is positive, you're waiting for the culture to come back, you're not necessarily wrong to give them antibiotic therapy. And then again, referral to the specialist. Educate, 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 drink water, cranberry juice, capsules, stay hydrated. Endometrial cancer, postmenopausal bleeding. So we know that with our postmenopausal bleeding, they have not had any bleeding at all. And now we have this episode of bleeding. Most common gynecological malignancy, painless vaginal bleeding is cancer unless proven otherwise for bladder cancer. Same thing with endometrial. If you have this vaginal bleeding and they're postmenopausal, further investigation is warranted. 6% of cancers in all women increases with age, higher in Caucasians. However, again, the mortality rate, as I discussed earlier, Contributing factors, obesity, glucose intolerance, again, those pre-diabetics and diabetics, the use of the estrogen, certain diseases and conditions, 
and most common, your sign and symptom is postmenopausal bleeding. Histological tests, those transvaginal ultrasounds, ultimately a biopsy, which you're referring them out to GYN to get the biopsy done. Pelvic ultrasounds, pelvic examinations, take a look and see, is there anything abnormal that is concerning? Treatment is surgical excision, and then your post-treatment surveillance and follow-up, and you're going to take your advice from your specialist. What does GYN want? What does oncology want? What are the guidelines? That's what we need to follow. Educate about the significance of postmenopausal bleeding and the avoidance of estrogen without progesterone. Ovarian cancer, unfortunately, is asymptomatic usually until it's been metastasized. It's the most lethal, most lethal because we don't usually start to have symptoms until it's almost end stage. And there's multiple different types of cancer. Um, the etiology really is unknown. Uh, we do know that hormones run together. So if there is a history of ovarian or endometrial breast, we should be monitoring all of those as well as your family history. Fifth most common malignancy in women, 70% women are older than 55, and then your incidence rate for Caucasians. Contributing factors increase age and family history. We talk about it, genes, you can't change your genes. Why a good family history and health history is so important. Usually asymptomatic, unfortunately it's overlooked, and then we don't find it until it's end stage. Pelvic exams, ultrasounds, laparoscopies, again, they're going to be re referred out to get these testing done and any other differential diagnosis or workup. Treatment is surgical excision chemotherapy. Hematology oncology or GYN oncology is going to be directing this. Follow-up visits every three months is most likely going to be with them, but may also be with you. And unfortunately, the end result oftentimes with ovarian cancer is death. Prevention prophylaxis, again, is screening, risk-reducing pregnancy, oral contraceptives. We see less of a cancer risk with women who have had babies and have been on birth control. Refer to a genetic counselor, gynecological, oncologist, because these are the specialists who manage these. And again, education is so important. The importance of those annual pelvic exams, looking at anything that's abnormal. And then there's an ovarian cancer symptom index that you can also take a look at. You know, you can download. They have a lot of pamphlets and things like that for education. Your textbook and additional readings for you.